So just before I decided to um, leave from Panama, I wanted to do a tour to combine my love for astronomy and environmental protection. So this all started because I was invited to give a talk at the Royal Astronomical Society um, conference two years ago, and I did more of a science-themed talk uh, on some of the latest discoveries. Then I thought, well, hey, actually, there's something here maybe if I um, change it for more of a, a public audience who maybe doesn't have a huge amount of um, science background or some of the latest astronomical discoveries. So I taught a, a little talk early this year when we went back down to level one called Eco Nord, which I thought I'd just give for you today. Many of this, much of the stuff you'll know, but hopefully it's presented in a, in a new way and may maybe even make you think about a few things slightly differently. So um, yeah, I'm one of the, the eight Green MPs, or as I joke, one of only nine members of parliament not currently under investigation by the serious fraud <laughs> office, <laughs> which is true. Um, so I'm, I just call myself an Eco Nord, but as people on Twitter pointed out, it actually more accurately says eco nut. <laughs> so I should have thought of that. But it's true, right? And I'm going to own that because actually I am a total eco nut. Um, I've spent my entire adult life, ever since I was 18, campaigning to protect the environment. Uh, when I was 14, I won the Royal Society's Environmental Essay Competition, arguing against nuclear power. Uh, and I won a trip to every 14 year old boy's fantasy, Gracefield and Lower Hutt to check out Industrial Research uh, Limited's facilities, which is very cool. And I spent 20 years, 10 years uh, at Greenpeace, trying to protect the environment, and now a decade in Parliament. I put my body on the line, taking you know, direct action to protect the environment. I've campaigned, I've lobbied, I've protested, uh, I've got myself arrested, <laughs> uh, and got myself elected, uh, all to protect this beautiful world of mine. Actually, um, this is me, I chained myself to a McDonald's factory in South Auckland to stop them um, feeding their chickens with horrible stuff. But I've always loved space. Um, you know, growing up I was playing Space Lego, playing Space Invaders. You know, it felt like the science fiction was becoming science reality back then. This is one of my favourite books growing up as a kid. It was called the Usborne Future Cities book. It was published in 1979. And can you imagine it? In 1979 they predicted the 2020 Olympics will be held on the moon. We're not even having the 2020 Olympics on Earth this year since I've been cancelled. Um, but for me, it was out at sea. I used to sail on the Rainbow Warrior, one of the Greenpeace ships. And you know, away from the city lights, you know, at night in the, in the ocean, you can see all the stars. And I was looking out in the Milky Way, but you know, I just gained a, a true love for the stars. And politically, this has been a way that I've sort of refreshed myself and kept myself slightly sane in Parliament. I was remembering there's a whole universe out there uh, and the beauty. Uh, so it's been a passion of mine, and I just want to share that passion with you. So I should clarify some things. You know, I know the election's really soon, but I'm not here to uh, convince you. you know, I'm not here to argue politics. I'm retiring. That's fine. Um, so there's nothing political. This was a joke for the kids. Some people thought it was the Octonauts, which is a kid's show. Um, but Econautics. I wanted to come up with this term because I couldn't find anything that accurately described what I was into, right? Which was the sense that space could be a source of inspiration and a source of new technology, new ideas and new technology to, to, to solve some of the down-home issues. You know, originally I wanted to call it like astro-environmentalism, but there is actually an academic field and that's kind of more like about mining asteroids or, you know, recycling on the International Space Station. And I wanted something a bit broader than that. Then I thought about um, maybe calling it astro-mentalist, but I thought that sounded too weird, like some sort of time traveling wizard who solves crimes or something. So I thought eco -nook. sounds kind of cool to, to combine my two passions, environmentalism and astronomy. So you might ask yourself, right, why would a Green MP, you know, a former clown, uh, be doing a presentation on space and the environment? And I acknowledge it's a bit random. Most politicians wouldn't be doing it. I could probably only get away with it because I'm retiring. You know, I'm not trying to care about my public profile or credibility. You know, I just want to talk about what I love and what I'm passionate about. And again, this is another photo from my friend Ian Wells in Dunedin. You know, for me, this is why I work to protect the environment. Because we live in a spectacular country and we've got a beautiful environment. And for me, looking up has been all about wonder and inspiration. And also, what a great time to be part of a group like this, you know. This genuinely is a golden age for, for space exploration, uh, for, for scientific research. We've never known more than what we know today. I mean, just on the drive, I was in Omaru this morning. You know, learning about um, the latest discoveries, what's happening on Venus, uh, with the, oh, what's the chemical called? It's um, phosph 
phosphate. You know, I was also reading this morning an article about rogue stars. There are there's 200 billion of them in between the galaxies. Maybe a trillion is the latest estimate. And a new class called hypervelocity rogue stars. They reckon when supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies collide, they can act like a slingshot. And in fact, these rogue hypervelocity stars could be traveling at up to a third of the speed of light traveling, and maybe this is, you know, they were positing that maybe this is how life panspermia could spread through the universe, which is, you know, every day we learn something new, and this is a genuine golden age for astronomical research. But to start with, does anyone know who this guy is? Captain Planet. Captain Planet. <laughs> Probably like that theme song stuck in your head. Um, so I, 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 I've got the slide up because he came on TV first in 1990, but I was nine years old. and. Globally, right, Captain Planet was on mainstream TV in prime time. It kind of signaled the environment was finally being taken seriously. It was mainstream, it was cool. It kind of gave the sense that it was starting to be fixed. This was the same time as the Rio Earth Summit. Governments were making all sorts of promises. But I also say it because since 1990, more emissions have entered the atmosphere since 1990 than all the 200, 300 years of the Industrial Revolution before. And why I say this is that what I'm talking about tonight isn't a story about something far away or distant. It's not about other generations. This is actually the story of our generation and what's happening. You know, it's a story about our home. It's not theoretical. It's not academic. This is about us. This is my favorite space image. Uh, you know, part of the Christmas Eve 1968 Apollo 8 um, mission. It was on my war in Parliament for many, many years. You know, called the Earthrise image. It's old news for, for us and our generation, but imagine seeing this for the first time. You know, it's kind of like looking in the mirror for the first time, the first time we've ever seen the whole Earth. We'd only seen corners of the Earth or the atmosphere. Um, I love it, right? Because this is home. Everyone, as Hal Sagan points out, you know, everyone we know, everyone we love, all the conflicts, all the petty dictators happen, you know, here. And you can juxtapose it with the hostile, you know, barrenness of the moon. It's been described as the most influential environmental photograph ever in history. And astronaut Bill Anders, who snapped it, said, we went to the moon to explore the moon, but what we really did on Apollo was explore the Earth. 50 years on, here's a more modern version by the Japanese Space Agency. Everything we depend on, our life support systems, clean energy, um, healthy atmosphere, thriving air systems, all happen here. It's been it's like we live in a spaceship, right? And it's been called this Spaceship Earth. Uh, I also love this image because it challenges the basic assumptions on the way we run society. Uh, because the way we run our economy is if we can grow forever, have infinite economic growth, and we can dispose of ever-growing uh, waste infinitely, but we live on a finite planet. You know, the, as we all know, right, the planet isn't growing. Uh, there isn't a backup second planet nearby that we can go to. But according to the World Wildlife Foundation, if everyone on Earth, or what, 7, 8 billion of us, consumed on a per capita level as New Zealanders, you would need between 5 and 7 Earths for the amount of resources and energy and waste disposal that we use. And it's that fact, which I think is so revolutionary, what attracted me to the Greens originally, but as um, part of my, my personal mentor, Jennifer Simons, who passed away sadly last year, and she was one of the first politicians in New Zealand to challenge that assumption that we can grow forever uh, on a finite planet. So let's start the presentation, eh? Uh, in New Zealand, we're famous for our stars. We've got um, Taika Waititi, Lord, those... <laughs> I know, it's a bit of a dead joke, I'm sorry. Um, but it's true, right? We're, we're, we're famous for our stars. In fact, it was the number one reason Japanese tourists took home a fond memory of New Zealand, was the fact that they could see the night sky in the Milky Way. Um, and we had the first ever dark sky reserve in the Southern Hemisphere. We're all here in Aotearoa, no matter your background, uh, because of the stars. The stars guided all of our ancestors here. Now, with my public presentation, I do a bit of a presentation on how to find south, but I don't think I need to demonstrate uh, that to this group. Um, again, here's um, my suburb in Otago, another wonderful photograph from Ian. Um, you know, again, demonstrating how we you know, rotate around the south celestial pole. But I've got a pop quiz for you. Does anyone know what the average colour of the universe is? Beige. You're too good. I was hoping <laughs> someone to say green, but um, it's beige. 
Um, so research from Johns Hopkins University combined the light from 200,000 uh, galaxies within 2 billion light years of Earth. They average it out, and this is the colour that comes out, beige, uh, called Cosmic Latte. Um, but as the Kiwi cricket team show you, nobody can look good in this. <laughs> <laughs> Except one man, uh, my hero Carl Sagan, the only man I believe on Earth who can rock beige. <laughs> Just cool. And um, so this presentation is in part um, uh, dedicated to my mentor, Jeanette Fitzsimons, but secondly uh, to one of my scientific heroes, an amazing communicator, um, an amazing scientist, uh, and someone very pro cannabis, uh, Carl Sagan. <laughs> you know, he communicated the, the wonders of space exploration, I think, in a way that uh, no one else has been able to, to since. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson does a good job, but Carl Sagan, I think, is the pinnacle. You know, recently we've discovered the hexagon in Saturn's North Pole, and we've discovered why it's there. We've discovered gravitational waves, space-time ripples, like, you know, when you throw a rock uh, into the lake. We've found more than 4,000 planets orbiting other stars. We've found planets with the density of cotton candy, actual sugar molecules in uh, interplanetary space, and planets where it probably rains diamonds. You know, it's weird, I find, that you can say this stuff, right? Planets with like cotton candy, sugar molecules in space, planets that rain diamonds, and they're like, yeah, okay, a scientist said. But then I meet so many people where you talk about climate change, and they're like, but it was cold last week. This is kind of um, weirdness. So when Carl Sagan died in 1996, this was the best image we had of Pluto, using the most powerful telescope at the time, Hubble. Fifteen years later, when I was, um, last year, we got this beautiful image from the Planetary Society uh, from New Horizons. Back in 96, when I was 15, uh, when that first image was taken, we knew that black holes existed, but last year we got to photograph one for the first time, um, or more accurately, the event horizon around it. You know, I can't believe it. This is, it took eight Earth-based supercomputers uh, to, or, to image this object, which is 55 million light years away. You know, a huge amount of effort from around the world, and people on Twitter went, but it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, it's funny, right? Like, uh, we were doing all this great effort, but I guess that's Twitter for you. Um, sorry, this um, You can't complain about this image, the um, Eagle Nebula taken by Hubble. You know, as an aside, the images I'm going to show you tonight, and I wanted to share some of the beautiful space images which are out there. You know, as you know, most of them are true color. You know, you obviously um, change so they're better um, communicated. And researching for this, I found there's actually a job title out there, which is called the Master of the Digital Universe, to colorize and release some of these images. So that might be a pretty awesome um, job for any of you post-university, Master of the Digital Universe. But this is, our, this is our environment, you know? This is our universe, this is a, a part of it. Now, um, during the, the, the public presentation, I tried to add a little bit of um, theatrical science communication to make it interesting. Um, to communicate it. So um, I, I can't do that now because I don't know if the university would let me. But what I'd do is let a whole bunch of different chemicals on fire to show that they, flames burn at different you know, colours, which is a good way to demonstrate spectroscopy and the fact that each element has its own unique chemical signature. So apology if I can't light fire to the room tonight. But I, I wanted to communicate, you know, that Using proxies, we can actually know a huge amount about what's actually out there in the universe. You know, in fact, that we can tell a huge amount of star just by the colour that it's at. So, for example, red stars are called the white stars, which are called the blue stars. So it's quite interesting from the Green Party perspective that green is right in the middle of the colour spectrum, and um, at that point in the spectrum, the all the lights being produced. That's why you'll never see a green star, but also for the United Future, why you'll never see a purple star. <laughs> it's a bit of an old political joke, so no one really got that one. Um, but, um, so, you know, this, using science and things like spectroscopy, we can understand why it could be raining diamonds on Neptune, uh, or many other things. And why I want to demonstrate that the colour um, spectroscopy point is that this is how we might find light in space. Now you guys probably know that this is a more more or the artistic rendering of it, you know, the strange elongated object, the first interstellar visitor. I think we found another one subsequent, haven't we? Um, which is amazing. And of course, people, as soon as we 
you know, had word that there was a, an interstellar visitor, people would restrain to the like to shake people like, it's an alien probe, or like, it was an alien light ship, or, or other things like that. Now, from my perspective, right, it's unlikely that we're going to find uh, um, a UFO, right, landing on the White House lawn, or the GCSB is going to listen in on radio, alien telephone conversations. But it's actually using things like colour and spectroscopy might be the way that we find life in space, or more accurately, pollution. Now, I'm not saying pollution is a good thing, but when the James Webb Space Telescope launches, I don't keep getting these late, hopefully in a couple of years, you know, using the spectra and analysing the atmospheres of uh, exoplanets, we could discover lifetime. I mean, I find this simply amazing that we could be on the cusp of discovering life, not just the phosphine on Venus, but we could find life. So, you know, if we turn our um, James Webb Space Telescope to an exoplanet and find do oxygen dioxide, oxygen, and ozone, we found life. You know, we found the chemical signature for life in the atmosphere. And if we detect detect something artificial that could only be created industrially, like um, fluorinated gases, we found direct evidence of life in space. We could do that in a matter of only a couple of years, which I find just amazing. Will we find life you know, in, in our solar system? You know, Venus is right down the bottom of the list, but now it's being wrapped up, and hopefully we'll send some um, probes there, and there's a couple of, I think, discovery class projects in the pipes, which might get to the go ahead now. But when I was young and growing up, scientists always said, well, to find life, you've got to follow the water, right? Um, and originally, when I was young, we thought that water in space was incredibly rare. But now we've found a gigantic ocean beneath the surface of Jupiter's moon Europa. We've found one on Jupiter's Ganymede. We've found on Saturn's Enceladus. We even discovered water on the tiny dwarf planet Ceres in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Now, this is how cool space is, right? That even on this dwarf planet in the asteroid belt, we found this ancient cryovolcano that was spewing out ice as a volcano spews out lava on them. And modern science has uh, published reports recently found that water today is even driving active surface changes on this dwarf planet. Or we'll take Mars. Fun fact, the only planet solely inhabited by robots. <laughs> yeah, we know of. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, the Italian Space Agency, I think last year, reported a 20 kilometer subglacial lake uh, on, on Mars. But here's the environmental connection, is that I find it weird that people like Elon Musk, right, are really hyping Mars as sort of the place to live. And I, I 100% support space research. I want us to become a collective space-fearing species. But the idea of colonizing Mars, I think, is a little bit flawed in the sense that, you know, why would you leave uh, you know, a house with a, a great heat pump, you know, good insulation, a nice garden, beautiful views, clean air, to go live in a hole in the ground with radioactive, you know, toxic soil? And that's kind of the choice, rather than cleaning up that house in the first place. So that's sort of my effort, I believe we can do both. You know, I believe our tiny blue dot is pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it, you know, is paradise. If you're an alien visitor, you wouldn't call us Earth. You'd probably call us planet ocean, because it covers 71% of our surface. You know, we're swimming in this stuff, but I find this fascinating. Despite everything we've, we've learned about space and our own planet, we still don't know where our water came from. For a long time, we thought it came from icy comets or asteroids that brought it to the primordial Earth. But once we sent up a, a, a fleet of uh, space probes and took some chemical uh, signal uh, recordings from Haley, Hale, Hayataki, Hale Prop, and the 67P Chirimiog Gerimasenko, I'm always like proud that I can say that, um, we found that that uh, chemical signature didn't line up with the actual water we have on Earth. So now the most likely scenario is in fact the water formed on the primordial Earth, which I find is just a, a fascinating thought that. You know, our water is indigenous. Um, our, we, we truly are a watery earth. Um, but sadly, in New Zealand, you know, we track the stuff like rubbish. And you can't swim in two thirds of our lowland lakes and stream because of pollution going into it. Um, and we lose 200 million tonnes of topsoil. You know, I think one of our most precious resources every single year in New Zealand because of the way we farm. So I just think we should treasure and look after our water a bit better because it's ancient and it's special. Now going under, under the water for a moment, this is um, footage from the deepest point on the ocean. 
you know, more people have been to the moon than the, the deep sea. But last year, Victor Vescova, an American explorer, went to the five deepest points in the five oceans uh, he found. Uh, this is a, a new species of animal they discovered. But once he got to the deepest point, the Mariana Trench, 10,927 meters in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and that, that, along with this new species, guess what he found? In the deepest, darkest, most remote place on Earth. Yeah, plastic bag, uh, which I find just amazing. Uh, and according to the World Economic Forum, by 2050, if current trends continue, we will have more plastic by weight in the oceans than fish by weight in the oceans. That's if we keep current trends. So um, I don't want to bum you out. I see all your faces looking a bit down. But the good news is, right, that um, since New Zealand bans single-use plastic bags, we've stopped 1.1 billion plastic bags in the last three years going into the environment just in New Zealand. So I think we can turn that around. That's good. Um, I've got a bit of a personal deep sea story to, tell, uh, to share with you. This is something I saw in the middle of the Tasman Sea when I was sailing on the Wrangell Warrior. Um, so we were out there trying to stop deep sea fishermen from dragging these giant airplane sized nets up and down the seafloor. Uh, and we filmed them throwing over them this 500 year old Gorgonian coral. Um, they were telling the international, uh, the UN and the international media, their nets sort of floated over the bottom. And you know, we presented this evidence to the UN, it's now been banned between New Zealand and Chile in the high seas, which is great. But why, why I want to tell you the story is that um, the fishermen were quite angry, right? They brought a mortar to hurl potatoes at us. Um, <laughs> they uh, put their fire hoses on us to spray us as we got close. And they threw the fish at us. And we managed to get 10 fish on board. Uh, some of them were species new sites, by the way, from the deeps uh, of the ocean. But actually, we spent about 15 minutes, and it was quite rough sea, trying to get this particularly big fish that we saw in the distance that they dumped overboard. So we spent 15 minutes going up and down these waves, finally hauled it on board. And you know what it was? It was a big piece of plastic, which had been trawled from kilometers uh, down on the seafloor. So for me, that was my sort of personal um, example, just what an impact we're having on the marine environment. Um, I remember a crew member told me about when he was sailing in the Arctic, he saw a cook can embedded in an iceberg as it sailed past. But this is a, a, a graphic showing growth of space junk, space waste. Um, there's a local Otago company, sorry, a company based in Otago, Leonardo's, who's now tracking 250,000 uh, objects to try and avoid collisions in space. Uh, something I'm quite personally proud of when Parliament was considering the Outer Space and High Altitudes Activities Act that allowed the rocket lab to start launching the rockets, uh, getting the launch regime up and running, I managed to amend the law to make sure an orbital debris mitigation plan had to be provided before they got an approval to, to launch. So we're trying to actively manage it in New Zealand so we reduce space waste. But for me, right, this, um, and when you think about the oceans too, this shows the impact we're having on our planet. You know, we've got plastic literally in the deepest, most remote places. We've got junk orbiting us hundreds of kilometers above our heads. We're truly having a, an impact on this planet of ours. It's amazing to think it was only 1977 when we discovered a new way of powering life independent from the sun uh, through the discovery of the hydrothermal vents, the black smokers at the seafloor. Um, but can you believe it? There's actually a, an old mining permit application in New Zealand to try and bulldoze these things to try and get the minerals out from them, which I'm fundamentally opposed to. But it's amazing, right? Since we've started exploring the deep, we've found amazing alien-like critters. And these are some of my favorites. Yeah, will we find something like this, you know, at Europa's oceans? Or my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually a photo of me after 10 years in Parliament. <laughs> um, you know, is there like out there? It was Arthur C. Clarke who said, well, there are one of two possibilities exist, and they're both equally terrifying. Either we're alone, or we're not. Equally terrifying. It's something Carl Sagan explored in his movie Contact, uh, his book Contact, which was turned into a movie. Now, one of my favorite stories from um, sort of theorizing about life in space is, you know, Enrique Fermi. You all know the Fermi paradox, but I love the story that, you know, he was one of the um, inventors of the atomic bomb, and he was sitting around a table in 1950, uh, with a bunch of other physicists, and they're discussing like these new flying saucer reports, which they've been reading about in the paper. And of course, being physicists, right, they weren't just talking about it, they're doing the maths. 
they calculated the distance between stars and how fast you could go and what the, the limits were. And in the middle of lunch, he just blurted out, where are they? Where is everybody? Because obviously he was familiar with the, you know, the, Drake, the Drake equation and the fact that there are so many stars out there, so many potential for life, where are they? Um, I love that your joke about um, robots, we don't know about them. Because in, in one of my earlier slides, I talked about one, uh, I think, terrifying theory, why, why it's so silent, is the estimating civilization hypothesis. Because maybe space is so quiet, right, that um, they're not there. Maybe they're so quiet that everyone's on like um, silent mode. They're not broadcasting because they're scared of you know, hunters out there called the, the dark forest theory, why we can't detect light. Another theory is the estimation hypothesis, which is the idea that you know, on a planet, artificial intelligence took, took fruit and it grew. And its sole job was to, um, to do as many um, computations as possible. And in the end, it grew and grew and colonized its entire planet to do as many, and turned the planet basically into a planet-sized computer to maximize as many computations as it could do. But realizing that space uh, would be cooler in trillions of years in the future as the universe spread and um, you can probably have a more scientific name. Is that entropy if it's cooling down? No? Entropy is declining? It's expanding? So anyway, this, this you know, supercomputer that's colonized the planet realizes it will be even more efficient in a cooler universe trillions of years in the future. Basically goes on sleep mode but sends out a fleet of probes um, to wipe out um, any competitors that might take over its ability to do computations in the future. Kind of like if you chop daisies off the lawn around the field. Now I cut that from the real presentation for the public because it's quite a dark theory. <laughs> <laughs> to my, uh, to the Fermi paradox, which I find quite terrifying. But, um, you know, why is it so quiet? Why is there a Fermi paradox? Um, I don't have access to the but in the public presentation what I'd do is I'd say well, we do know that there is life in space. And I'll quickly go to www.howmanypeopleareinspacerightnow.com, which is kind of a cool website to check out. And it comes up with the answer, which I think is about five uh, at the moment. And then what I do is pull out one of those old fashioned overhead projectors and I do the Drake equation, which I'm sure I don't need to tell what the Drake equation is um, to anyone in this room, which you know, calculates the, the, the chance of life in space. Now, Drake originally concluded it was between 100 and 100,000 civilizations in the Milky Way. I know a group of academics late last year put out an estimate there are 306. I don't know how they came to such a <laughs> precise number, but that was their estimate. Um, but still, the fact is, why the Fermi paradox? Why this great silence? You know, maybe there's 306, maybe there's 100,000 um, you know, civilizations out there. So maybe the key element isn't the amount of planets or the amount of planets where life forms, it's actually L is the key, key point in the Drake equation. It's the length of time that civilizations last. So the question is what fraction of intelligent civilizations survive long enough for anyone to detect their signals, you know, or their um, artifacts in space? Um, and this has been called Great Filter. Maybe if you're getting to where we are today is incredibly hard. Um, maybe life in space might be common, but there are these filters to get through from basic evolutionary steps through to avoiding risks, you know, for their civilizational survival. You know, we've been through them, right? Remember that giant asteroid um, that banged in, sorry, that giant planet that banged into us and we got a moon? All that time a gamma ray burst killed 90% of all life on Earth in our history. All that time, you know, the Chipsalab asteroid cracked into us and wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, it's quite interesting, actually, there's a new paper published in the National Proceedings uh, of the Academy of Scientists and found that it wasn't just the, the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, it was the fact that it landed in a very unique location. So obviously this is the Yucatan um, Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. It was an incredibly um, carbon limestone rich environment, basically uh, it was ocean, it had been ocean floor, heaps of like limestone like the cliffs of Dover. So actually it wasn't, the asteroid had an impact, the global cooling from all the dust in the atmosphere had an impact. But the fact that it hit this massive carbon deposit uh, rapidly changed the acidity of the pH level of the oceans. So this sort of toxic cocktail uh, wiped out the basis of the marine ecosystem, which had such you know, impacts in the terrestrial environment as well. Now I talk about this because this is quite a, a warning for us now, because we're changing the chemical pH level of our oceans by putting all that carbon into the atmosphere. 
So maybe actually the answer to the Fermi paradox is environmental collapse. You know, maybe L, the level of advanced civilizations, uh, is very short because they wipe themselves out um, through climate change, for example. Now this is a graph that, which shows the annual average temperature change from 1850 to 2017. And you can see a very clear trend, right, that we are changing average temperatures. And it was planetary scientists like Jim Hansen, who was a leading Venus uh, researcher, that first warned us about climate change. Because he saw you know, what was happening on Earth's sister, Venus, you know, a planet roughly the, the, the same size, um, that's now hot enough to melt lead. You know, the Soviets sent a huge amount of probes to the planet, but we got very little data back from them because they literally kept melting. I mean, it's hot enough to melt lead on the surface of the planet um, because of uh, the runaway greenhouse gas effect. Now, Venus, of course, once had oceans just like Earth, but what happened is, is the, the blanket of um, greenhouse gases trapped the heat in the ocean, you know, added more uh, water vapour to the atmosphere, and water as a greenhouse gas, acts as a greenhouse gas, led to a runaway effect where more water into the atmosphere added to more blanket, leading to more water, until eventually the, water, the oceans boiled away, and that temperature was trapped. And now today, Venus's atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. And it was because of studying Venus that we first saw maybe something similar was happening on Earth. You know, right now we're seeing Arctic fires are up 35% on last year's record uh, fires. Uh, we're seeing the UK Met Office say we might have 1.5 degrees of warming within five years, um, temporarily, which is quite terrifying. So, um, um, yeah, so we've got to learn some of the lessons from our sister, Venus. Now, hopefully you can hear this. I don't know if you'll be able to, but here's a little example about some of my work in Parliament. Imagine this glass of water represents the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere in 1850. Now this is a good thing. If it wasn't here, it estimated Earth to be as much as 35 degrees colder. However, by 1950, human beings had increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere to levels higher than it had been in over 100,000 years. Now today, we've added so much CO2 to the atmosphere that we're locked in for a temperature increase of close to one and a half degrees as a result. Science have said CO2 levels any higher than this could cause catastrophic climate change. Increases in the Earth's temperature will struggle to adapt to. But of course, we've already found considerable amounts of fossil fuels that we haven't even burst yet. The tablet in, shall we? <laughs> so that's not good. That's more CO2 than the planet has seen in 420 million years. Yet, according to oil lobbyists and oil apologists, right here in New Zealand, we have to keep digging. You know why? Because of the sheer amount of money it's going to make them. All right, then, well, let's handle these unexplored preserves to the glass, shall we? <laughs> 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 See, yeah, not a good idea. It's <laughs> a little life science for you. <laughs> um, so for me, like climate change, right, it's just a, a symptom of the folly of trying to have infinite economic growth on a finite planet, the thing that Jack Simons warned us about. And to illustrate this, here's a, an interesting thought experiment by the um, investor Jeremy Grantham. So he asked a group of mathematicians uh, where he was speaking, um, imagine how big ancient Egypt's economy would be. You know, this is the longest civilization. If they'd started with a box, so imagine the first king, Nama, uh, had a, a box, a chest, that was a cubic square meter, right? How big that box would be if it grew at modern growth rates, 4.5% for the 3,000 years the Egyptian civilization lasted for. And we ask these, you know, mathematicians, well, how big would that chest of stuff be? Um, and, you know, he asked me, you know, would it be as big as the Earth? You know, as big as from here to the moon, as big as Jupiter, as big as the sun? Does anyone want to have a guess how big that chest would be? Full solar system? Yeah, do you know what the answer is? It's 1580 octillion suns. Um, so it's 1500, I mean, I had to Google with an octillion, right? <laughs> it's 1580 followed by 27 zeros. That's how big a, you know, growing at 4.5% a cubic meter is after 3,000 years. Which means just demonstrates, you know, compound um, uh, uh, interest, sorry, compound growth, right? Uh, and how we're trying to do it. And I think this is why we're having such a huge impact on this planet. Um, um, we've, you know, altered 75% of the world's land surface. Uh, only 3% of our oceans uh, are left untouched presently. 
and we've got a million species on the cusp of extinction in our lifetime. So we truly are in the Anthropocene, a whole geological record where you can point out where we were. Right? So imagine the future, right? Where humans have disappeared for whatever reason. You know, when the footsteps on the moon have maybe disappeared, you know, when our cities have rusted away, people will know that we were here today because of the species extinction that happened in the geological record, which you can link to our impact. So it's kind of like we're in this life raft, you know, the spaceship Earth, and it's kind of like poking holes in the side of it. Um, So I've talked a bit about climate change, which you know our Prime Minister says is our nuclear free market. But I just want to quickly before I leave all the bad, depressing stuff, um, to talk about the other nuclear free moment, which is nuclear weapons, because there are currently 14,000 nuclear weapons on Earth pointed at someone else, and maybe this is the answer to the Fermi paradox and the Great Filter. Maybe other civilized other planets have advanced, have got technology, then they've discovered nuclear weapons and wiped themselves out. I mean, we've only had nuclear weapons for what 70 years. Likely, we've only used two of them. Uh, it's something good old Carl Sagan warned us about when he was one of the first researchers looking at nuclear winter. Before Carl Sagan and his um, other researchers did their work, people thought we could have you know, limited nuclear wars. We couldn't let them off. Yet it was the research of Carl and others that found that all that dust in the atmosphere would have global impacts. Now this isn't a photograph of um, Mercury or the Moon. This is a photograph of the Nevada Nuclear Weapons Test Range. And I've got an amazing story for you, which is good. Uh, pop quizzes and pop quizzes, that actually maybe the first thing in space wasn't Sputnik, uh, human cause. It was a man called Carl. This is just amazing. So in 1957, uh, the US was testing nuclear weapons at the Nevada test site, and they um, had detonated the bomb in a 485 foot deep shaft. And for some reason, they thought, well, we should put a cover on it, right? So they put a half ton iron man called cover on top of the shaft, detonated the bomb, and they couldn't find it. Um, and so they were arguing, you know, where did it go? You know, was it was a vaporized, did it blow up, you know, did it travel somewhere? So for the next test, they actually set up a series of slow motion cameras around the test site to, to, to monitor it. And um, so this is actual um, Robert Brownlee, who was an astrophysicist who designed the test. He repeated the experiment, and what he found was that um, as they detonated the bomb, the, um, the shaft traveled at a speed of 125,000 miles per hour, which he calculates as the fastest ever man-made object, and using modern supercomputers, and I read this in a reputable source, they estimated in recent years that this object probably passed Pluto in 1961. So when you think New Horizons took what was it, like 12 years or something to get to Pluto, this thing got there in four years. It's <laughs> one <pretty long. laughs> But did you know that we also detonated nuclear weapons in space? Um, this is you know, not art, this is a photo of the Starfish Prime nuclear test conducted by the US government um, in 1962, I believe. Um, yeah, so they detonated more than a dozen nuclear weapons, Soviet and US governments, in space to try and detect, and this is how we know about the Van Allen belt, for example. Uh, for example. But this, this detonation of Hawaii actually took out a couple of satellites, destroyed some electronics in New Zealand, and the um, radiation from this is still orbiting the Earth today, which I think shows that, you know, um, I don't know how anyone got through approval to detonate nukes in space, but that radiation is still out there and it's still circling us. But um, luckily, uh, and even worse, there was a serious proposal to detonate a nuclear weapon on the moon. Um, in 1950s, the US Army had a project called, I think it was A19, which was to detonate a, a nuke on the moon to, to try and work out what the moon was made of. Um, we did only discover that this proposal existed in the year 2000 when the biography of Carl Sagan was published. Because as a young researcher, he was doing the fundamental physics on this proposal. Uh, so I just find that fascinating. But, so while we often talk about you know, climate change and species extinction as existential risks for us, we can't forget that almost every other country on Earth hasn't had their nuclear free moment like New Zealand has. So, I've talked about a whole bunch of you know, ways that we can wipe ourselves out, you know, um, asteroids, gamma rays, climate change, nuclear weapons. Um, but I, you know, I couldn't just leave it at that, so I want um, to say you know, we just don't know how lucky we are. Um, we've got this gorgeous planet with just the right amount of gases, unlike Venus, to keep a stable temperature. You know, we're big enough to keep our oceans, um, unlike Mars. We've got this great magnetic sphere which protects us from cosmic radiation. 
We've got Jupiter up there, which helps attract some asteroid heads that could bang into us. You know, we're in a, a quiet corner of the Milky Way, far away from you know, Betelgeuse or other potential sources of supernova. We just don't know how lucky we are. So wouldn't it be a tragedy if we wiped ourselves out uh, when we've got this beautiful paradise and so many things in our favor? But it's not like we haven't dealt with global challenges before. This is obviously you know, an image of the ozone hole over Antarctica. And it was only in 1976 that it was you know, overwhelmingly proven that it was uh, CFCs and other fluorinated gases which were burning a hole in the ozone, you know, leading to skin cancers and other effects. But within 11 years, world governments had signed up to the Montreal Protocol and had seriously started reducing fluorinated gases. Now the ozone hole is healing. I mean, it's amazing to think that in only 11 years, world governments could come together to deal with a planetary problem. For me, it shows that we can grapple with these global problems. And remember that things can move for the good really fast, or I guess slowly to start with. So, you know, we think humans started first using stone tools uh, 2.6 million years ago. 150,000 years ago, we were still using pretty much the same stone tools. Um, then 7,000 years ago, we discovered copper. Then bronze, 5,000 years ago. Iron, 3,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, we developed paper, steel. 1,000 years ago, glasses, clocks, rockets, the first paper money. 400 years ago, Galileo invented the telescope. 200 years ago, Michael Faraday invented the electric generator. 100 years ago, the Wright brothers first took their first engine powered airplane. Then 70 years later, we landed on the moon. You know, it took us millions of years to get from one rock to a slightly better rock, and then <laughs> a generation to get from flying to going to the moon. Um, you know, I find it amazing to think in 1961 when John F. Kennedy said, you know, we're going to the moon in this decade, um, the US had 15 minutes of manned spaceflight experience. Yet he'd made this goal of getting there in less than nine years. And eight years later, they landed on the moon. Um, Scientists have said we have about 10 years to, to seriously reduce our emissions to a catastrophic climate change. So when people say we just don't have time, we do. We've done amazing things in less time before. And I think actually getting to the moon has some great examples for dealing with global challenges like climate change. Um, I think there are three big lessons for us. The first is the power of youth. Does anyone know the average age of um, mission control in, and engineers of the Apollo program? Is it 28? Yeah. 28. It was 28 year olds on average that got us to the moon. Today at NASA it's 47 is the average age for employees. Um, and you know, when you look at climate change, it's young people like Greta Thunberg, it's the youth climate strike movement that's leading on climate change. You know, I think the second lesson of Apollo is it took a huge investment, right? And we're going to need a huge investment to tackle climate change. Modern um, accounting estimates of the total cost of Apollo was 490 billion US dollars. Uh, that's in inflation adjusted terms. That was the cost of the program, nearly half a trillion dollars to get to the moon. But you know what? Every year on Earth, we spend 600 billion on fossil fuel subsidies, production and consumption subsidies. So every year, we spend more than we spent on the decade getting to the moon on promoting fossil fuels, which I think is some, uh, staggering. Um, I'm quite proud that I personally, this term of parliament, uh, negotiate with the government to end the $76 million in subsidies we were giving to oil companies, which we've been giving out for previous years, and we've stopped that, so we're cutting fossil fuel subsidies. But there's plenty of money, right, if we're subsidising fossil fuels to do great things. It's going to take a big investment. And the third good news is big investments in technology like this pays dividends, right? Um, like Apollo did for modern computing. Um, this is Margaret Hamilton with the code she wrote uh, for the guidance control computer. Which I think is just amazing. We wouldn't have, you know, phone and modern computing without the significant investment in Apollo. In fact, I love it, right? The guidance computer um, used an old form of coding, had five digits, but also instead of like adding software as you would today, they actually hardwired. The software was hardwired into the um, computer, which I, I just find amazing. Um, so, yeah, we're going to see great technology. I mean, think of the first solar panel in space with the Vanguard One satellite in 1957. So today, you know, the solar in space. I'm 38. Across my lifetime, the price per watt of solar electricity has dropped 99%, and it keeps dropping. Um, I got to hang out at Tesla and was the head of their battery research department a few years ago. And what we're seeing in lithium-ion batteries is something akin to 
Moore's laws of computing, which is the halving of costs every 18 months. The technology you know, should give us lots of reasons to be optimistic about climate change. Uh, people at my own university, like um, Vic, this is Dr. Justin Hotchkiss, who's actually leading the world in uh, nanotechnology for solar panels, using um, lasers uh, to find printable, bendable solar panels. Um, you're also world leader in terms of aluminium batteries, which might be a much more cheaper form of energy storage than lithium ion. So we've got these great you know, sources of inspiration in Great Wire, thank you, New Zealand. Or friends of mine, like Dr. Greg Bodica, who in Alexandra is working on weather forecasting on Mars for NASA, um, who's also um, working on pollution detectors. So in many countries, particularly developing countries, it's quite difficult to get accurate views of pollution. Often you need someone with a detector, right, to go to the top of the smokestack and do a measurement. And there's all sorts of problems with corruption or other you know, problems getting away. Greg's working on satellites which can pinpoint detect sources of pollution, no matter the weather, no matter the day or night, and get an accurate figure. Uh, you know, we can use, as the government's now investing to 26.5 million in methane set, you know, to find sources of methane pollution from around the world. So, you know, and this is partly why I wanted to do this presentation, because I've had so many conversations with environmentalists who say, ah, oh, don't invest in space, right? We've got all these problems on Earth. What a waste of money. Actually, I believe investing in space is a great way to tackle the problems here on Earth. And, you know, it's something I've actively supported across my career. And now in the lower New Zealand, right, we've got um, 12,000 people indirectly employed in the space economy, and space revenue was $1.75 billion last year alone. So this is something real, something tangible, something employing thousands of Kiwis today. But that 1.75 billion is only 0.27% of the global space pie, you know, less than a third of 1%. So we've got huge space to grow. And it's going to take you know, investment, big goals, the power of youth, uh, but it's also going to take more smart care by Peter Beck. Um, now I'm not a huge fan of some of the military cargo that Rocket Labs launching up into space, but um, it's amazing, right, that only 11 countries have reached orbit in space. Only 11. All the others did it with military or government space programs. We're the only country on Earth to have reached orbit uh, using a private space company, which I find is just amazing. And I remember first visiting Peter and visiting their factories by the Auckland Airport, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. And, um, you know, they were pioneering the use of carbon and fiber. Um, and they'd go to conferences overseas and the people would go, how do you make your rockets? And they're like, carbon fiber, it's how we build our boats. And people thought they were just amazing. And they're 3D printing their rockets. Um, and there's these great, you know, great sources of innovation. Um, it's actually quite a personal story. So I'm from Gisborne, and my mum sadly passed away last year. Um, and as we were doing the funeral, because you guys know the rockets are launching in Mahia, which is just south of Gisborne, so literally as we were putting mum to the ground, committing her to the soil, we saw this light in the distance, this thing right up to space. We didn't know what it was, right? We didn't know there was a rocket launch. So I like to think that was my mum, you know, heading up to heaven. But um, it, was a, it was a rocket launch from Mahia, from Rocket Labs. Now, I'm also wrapping up, but I also think space can represent the best of humanity. Uh, one of my favourite stories from space is the Voyager Golden Records, which Carl Sagan, you know, bolted onto the side uh, of those space probes, which is now in the deep of the, you know, the heliopause and is in interstellar space. You know, it's kind of like this cosmic message in a bottle. Now, what did we talk on the, the golden disk? It was 115 images, you know, it was, it was uh, sorry, 115 images, and also like the sound of like a mother and a baby, the sound of laughter, the sound of flight, the waterfall and bird sound. You know, it was uh, greetings in 55 other languages. And people Hello from the children of planet Earth. You know, this is what we put out into space. It was the best of us. It wasn't about our conflicts or our problems or the you know, pollution and stuff. It was about what we loved about ourselves and it, it came together. The only thing is that they only got Carl Sagan six weeks to put together the golden disc. It was kind of a last minute thing. So I think one of the great tragedies, right? You've got like Chuck Berry and all this great music that's in interstellar space. But they couldn't get enough time to get the copyright rights to the Beatles. So our cosmic message in the bottle does not have the Beatles, which I find a tragedy. So um, look, I just hope um, you've, you've enjoyed my little presentation tonight. Um, what I've tried to do is maybe inspire you to think about some of your work and your passion about astronomy, how it can impact the environment. Because um, I, I, 
I reflect that in many cases we're quite disconnected, you know, from the stars that guided our ancestors. We're disconnected, you know, uh, from space. Today, because of light pollution, uh, two thirds of the United States citizens, fifty-six percent of New Zealanders, and half a European Union citizen can't see um, the night sky and can't see the Milky Way because of light pollution. Um, so we've lost the everyday beauty to you know see the, the wonder of the night sky. And we've got some great dark sky reserves, right? Like Araki, um, Mackenzie, um, a few other proposals like um, Brack Area. Um, and what I'd like to see is New Zealand's actually set a goal of being the first dark sky country on Earth. And what that means is not getting rid of lights. It's designing your lights smarter. Um, uh, and actually, we're going to save money, we're going to be more efficient, and we can see the beauty of the night sky and no effect like um, insect pollinators and stuff. So, I think that would be a great legacy for us um, to, to connect with the stars. So just to wrap up, you know, protecting the planet doesn't stop at the top of the atmosphere. Space is our environment. Um, maybe you'll join me as an eco uh, So here we are on Aotearoa because the stars that led us here. We're here on this planet because the stars that died to make us. And we'll only ever travel those stars if we learn the lessons they have for us. So at the start of the talk, I said I wouldn't ask you to do anything political. But maybe one thing I'd like to ask you to do is tonight to look out at the stars and think about you know, one thing that you love about this country, you know, maybe it's a favourite river or a favourite bush or some favourite place and think about how you could protect it. Because if every single person did that, right, we wouldn't have these environmental problems if we all took a little bit of action to save one thing. So here we are, as viewed from Saturn, when um, Cassini turned around, um, as Carl Sagan called our pale blue dot this tiny little town in the void. Um, here it goes.